today from this subject, power to keep running and leaping. Power to keep running and jumping. Praise the Lord. We're going on the offensive here. Power to keep running and leaping. With the emphasis, Sister Trevina, on to keep running. Because sometimes life will wear you out. Amen. Praise the Lord. Sometimes life will make you tired. You got to, you got to keep running. Good God Almighty. Am I right, Mother Hinton? You can't get tired. You got to keep running. Praise the Lord. Now, Father, bless us as we preach today in Jesus' name. Amen. Power to keep running and leaping. This song. I'm referring intentionally to chapter 22 as a song. Amen. Because verse 1 tells us that it is indeed a song. And um, it, this psalm shows the poetic side of this warrior king. You know, chapter 23 in verse 1 David is referred to uh, as the sweet psalmist of Israel. It's the last clause of the first verse. So he's a poetic warrior. Praise the Lord. Uh, and by the time he wrote this psalm, he was indeed the king of all Israel. So this psalm shows the poetic side of this warrior king and the exploits of his mighty men and his mighty God. I want to pause right here to see one of the most beautiful sights and acknowledge it. My mother. Praise the Lord, mama. Look at her. Look at her. Give my mother a big hand. God bless you, mama. Amen. Mother won't sit. She won't sit one row back. <laughs> All right. Praise the Lord. Told me the other day, son, keep on standing for the Lord. Said you, said, you got me. I'm standing with you. I felt something leap on the inside. <laughs> Talking to my mama. Amen. Oh, it's good to see you, mama. Praise the Lord. Now, you know, it means something to me. Yes, Praise the Lord. It means something to me. Let me try to get back into this. I, I done got happy now. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, this, this song. <laughs> In this poetic psalm, we hear some mighty things about the God of the Bible. Things that he did in David and things that he will do in us. God bless you, Tom. We learn theological truths about the identity of the God of the Bible in this psalm. In fact, God's reveal, God reveals his name which tells us a lot about his identity and his uniqueness. David asks in verse 32, who is God? You see that? Who is God? That is, who is El? E-L. El. El is one of the most ancient Hebrew ancient terms for the word God. El. El is used in the, in the Bible to describe the true and living God. Capital G-O-D. But 
L is also used to describe false gods, small g-o-d, and L is used to describe deities of any and every kind. So the question that he asks in verse 32 is, who is L? That is, who is, the question is, who is the original and continuing cause of all that exists? Who is the all-knowing, almighty, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, self-existing, uncreated creator? See, because you got to be all these things to qualify. Praise the Lord. To be God, you got to be self-existing, uncreated. Praise the Lord. You got to be the original cause, the uncaused original cause who causes all things to exist. Who is L? Who is the one who never sleeps and never slumbers, was never taught, yet knows everything and needs nothing from humans. Who is L, the one who always was, is, and forever will be. The question he asks in verse 32 is who is God? David answers by using God's revealed intimate name. He says, the King James says, save the Lord except the Lord, that is, who is El except Jehovah? Jehovah is the proper name of God. Amen. It's the name that God used to reveal himself to Moses. Exodus chapter 6, verse 2 through 3, And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. And I appeared unto Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, by the name God Almighty, that is El Shaddai, or very, very Elohim. I, I reveal myself to them by that name. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto them. Jehovah was God's covenant name, most prominently known in connection with his relationship with the nation of Israel. Jehovah is literally full of life. Jehovah means to be or being. You see, he hinted at Jehovah in Exodus 3 and 14 when Moses uh, asked God, says, says, when I go to Pharaoh, who do I say sent me? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. Now, yes, he says, Thou shalt say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me. That is the God, watch this play on word, who always is. I am the self-existing one. I am the uncaused cause. I am the wall that you hit. You can't go back in time indefinitely. See, you can't keep going back. Well, who made this? You go back. Well, this one. Who formed that? This one. What happened here? And you, uh, sooner or later, you got to hit the wall. When you hit the wall, that's God. He's the, everything comes from him. David said, I'll tell you who this being is. I'll tell you his name. His name is Yahweh. Praise the Lord. And then he asks, who is my rock? I got news for you, saints. All who are hooked on tranquilizers, uppers, downers, alcohol. Everybody's talking about legalizing marijuana, all these things. People are going through all kinds of changes, trying to find stability. Word rock means stability. Who is our stability? God 
is. Jehovah is our stability. Let me tell you something. He'll keep your mind. If you keep your mind stayed on Jesus. Sister Moles, he'll see you through. He's your rock. Praise Lord, you miss your little girl. You say, oh God, what am I going to do? And the Lord says, I'm your rock. I'm your stabling, stabilizing force. When the winds of life blow, you wonder, my God, what's going on? What's going to happen next? And you feel yourself coming unglued. God whispers, I'm your rock. I'm your high tower. Praise the Lord. I am your keeper. See, they, need to, they need to fly me to Hollywood. Let me teach, preach this to the stars because them people are crazy. They're falling apart. Praise the Lord. Liberals and conservatives alike are falling apart. People need somebody. See, see I'm, not with, I'm not with this secular shift in the church. I'm not with it. I'm not with this secular shift, this secular preaching, the preaching where you move further and further away from the Bible and you tell more and more anecdotal stories and you talk more and more about yourself and we move more and more from the ecclesiastical settings of the church and we become increasingly secular and worldly because there's no stability in that. The Bible even speaks of the rich of this world and said God has set them in slippery places. Their lives are filled with instability. One of the things I love about serving the God of the Bible is he has given me stability. Come what may. Just like you, I get rattled. All of us do. Life will rattle you for a moment but you don't stay right. He's a stabilizer. Don't you go to that college campus and lose your way. Next thing you know, you done got so rattled that here you are pledging. Then de you didn't denounce the Lord. Don't you let the world cause you to lose your way. Hey man, don't you let married life and the challenges of leading the family rattle you and you leave your wife and your children. Praise the Lord. You're sanctified. Don't you let the challenges of life make you quit your job. And there you go. Next thing you know, you're drinking. I'm just so hurt. No, no. So I'm not with this stuff. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not buying it. See, we're becoming too, too pitiful. I believe that the goal of some of these services now are just to make you cry. And you think by you standing there crying, you, you've gone in. I'm in now. And they're trying to make men cry is. See, so all these brothers are being trained to be crybabies, cry every service, get on the serve, get on the altar crying and whining. This is not God's way. God is our rock. He is our stabilizer. All of us cry sometimes, but you ought not cry all the time. Somebody say amen. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pump, pump your muscles up. I'm going to make you strong. God called me to strengthen you, not to make, make weakness fashionable and make you comfortable being a crybaby. God's our rock. I don't spend too much time on that. I got a hundred more things to preach. <laughs> but Sister Dooley, he's our rock. When life winds blow and mine don't they blow, it's good to know. See, the, the image of the rock is no matter, no matter the hurricane, no matter the storm, no matter the, the tsunami, no matter what, when, the, when they come in and the wind blow and the storm and everything, and sometimes it's raining so hard that you can't see, but once that storm has passed, guess what? That rock is still right there. That mountain is still there, unchanged, unmoved. That's the way God is. Amen. When the storm is over, he's still there. <laughs> I feel like running. This chapter tells us, us of God's ability to enlarge our path in life. Verse 37 says, thou hast enlarged my steps under me. 
so that my feet did not slip. Praise the Lord. Matter of fact, verse 37 and 30, 36 and 37, he says, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. That is, the shield of thy victory. And thy, I love this, thy gentleness hath made me great. Now get your pen out. Get your pen out because you got to write in your Bible. When the Bible talks about, right there in the King James, where it is translated, thy gentleness, literally what, what, what David is saying here, and, 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 I, and you, you'll study it. Gentleness, Sister Karen, is, uh, uh, he says here that God, listen to this, God swooped down. Gentleness is literally God's intervention. David said, you intervene. To make me great. While I was fighting my enemies. Amen. I'm going to show you in a minute what David said. God gave me power over situations and enemies that were too strong for me. Said I couldn't, I couldn't beat them. Except that you, your gentleness. Except that you swooped down. That you actually thought enough of me. To come down from where you were. Come down from where you are and to intervene on my behalf. Do I have anybody in here who can remember a time or times when God swooped down? <laughs> Woo! God swooped down and intervened on your behalf. And you're standing there saying, God, I can't believe that you did it for me. Little old me, Lord, I'm nobody, I'm nothing. And yet, yet you did it. What a mighty God we serve. I'm going to let you praise him right there. Hallelujah. You swoop down, you intervene to make me, David said, great. Hallelujah. <laughs> make me great, David says. And thou hast enlarged my steps under me. Uh, and and, and you remember now, this is the poem. This is the poem. This is not a poem of a crier. This is a poem of a warrior king. So you got you to you gotta read it in the context of fighting. He says, when you enlarge my feet under me so, I wouldn't, so my feet wouldn't slip, so my ankles wouldn't turn. He says, while I was fighting, you gave me space to fight. So that, you know, the devil can get so close up. You know, most people know how to fight. No, that one of the first things you do in a contest, in a fighting contest, you don't let nobody roll up on you and get too close. So there needs to be a certain amount of distance. You've lost the fight. If, you're, if your style is, you're going to keep your hand down, just let the man just walk up on you. you got both hands down. You're, you're not in a, in a fighting stance or anything. I mean, they can hurt you like that. They can stab you. you got, oh, no, you got to. That, that's such a thing as personal space. The first thing you hear, you hear, I don't get any closer now. See, God. Now you're turning. You're shifting. Yes, sir. So that you first in the shift, you're protecting your vital organs. And you're planting that back. Because when you throw that blow, you start right there. Bang! In the name of Jesus. I said in the name of Jesus, y'all. Is that all right, Tom? In the name of Jesus. So David said, while I was fighting, I was in a narrow strait, and it was easy for me to lose my footing and to turn my ankle. He says, God in law. He's a mighty God. God made my platform greater. Now I have room to fight. See, I can do that rope-a-dope. I can do whatever I need to do because the Lord gave me room. 
Somebody praise God for giving you room. God's giving you room right now. Y'all to praise him for giving you room. Thank you, Lord. He broadens the path. He gives us room. And there are so many other things. First Samuel chapter 2 records Hannah's song. Here in 2 Samuel chapter 22, we have David's song. And David sings. This song, uh, Dr. Foster, when I was studying this, I said, now this is kind of stuff that Brother Foster and 8 o'clock is like, and I won't have time to go into it. He writes this psalm, verse 1 tells us, after the Lord had given him victory over his enemies. So if you want to do a good Bible study next week, Go to chapter, 2 Samuel, chapter number 1, chapter number 2, chapter number 5, oh my, and chapter number 8. And read those chapters because it opens up. When, when 1 Samuel closes, it closes with the death of Saul. God, Saul and Jonathan, fall, Saul falls on his own soul. The word comes to David in 1 Samuel chapter 1 that Saul is dead. The man lied and said he killed Saul. He thought that was good news for David. That's why he shouldn't be a liar. And David killed him because David respected Saul. David lamented the death of Saul. Oh yeah. And then in chapter 2, if you study it, I, I, I really want to read it to you, but I don't have time today. And when you read chapter 2, you see where David was made king of Judah. Chapter 2, verse 4. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. Now, when David was made king over Judah, all right, he was not made king over all Israel. Abner, praise the Lord, the servant of the son of Ner, uh, he served a guy named Ishboseth. Ishboseth was Saul's son because now Jonathan is dead. Saul and Jonathan is wiped out on the same day. So Ishboseth uh, is taken by Abner, who served Saul, and he's made king over the greater part of Israel. So David is king over Judah. Uh, Ishboseth is king over Israel. If you study, you'll see where David becomes king. Oh, there's so much I want to tell you, but you, you read it. Uh, over uh, both Israel and Judah. In chapter 5, it says, Then came all the tribes of Israel. By now, uh, Ishbosheth is dead. Abner is dead. And, praise, and David didn't have to lift a hand to kill him. And... Uh, 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 so uh, that now we see the tribes of, of, of Israel. They came to David. Uh, and David was in Hebron because Hebron was David's headquarters while David was king over Judah. And they spake, saying, Behold, we are, thy, we are thy bone and thy flesh. That is, we are fellow descendants of Abraham. We are Jewish brethren. Also, in times past, when Saul was king over us. You know, we remember when Saul was in charge, they said this. This is why you ought to do right. Thou wast he that ledest out 
and brought us in Israel. We notice when Saul was the jurisdictional bishop. You worked hard for him. You served him. You did right by him. See, some of us want to be served when we get in it, get promoted, but if we don't want to serve when it's someone else. And folk remember. See, sometimes the way the Lord gets you is he let you, let you get what it is you want and then put a whole bunch of people under you who remember how you did your leader. And they fight from now on. And then, then all of a sudden you want to get spiritual and quote all the scriptures about how you're supposed to sum, uh, submit yourself to them that had to rule over you and all that. And people are sitting there saying, you didn't do it. When it was you, when it was you, you didn't submit. All you did was complain. All you did was rebel. You were busy all the time. You always had somewhere else to be, something else, somewhere else to go. Now you want us to come when you call us. They said, no, when Saul was king. We remember how you served Saul. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. This part right here should have you standing and cheering too. But, you're, but now you're not saying amen. And so he says, and, and the Lord said unto thee, thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel, even when you was serving Saul. The word was that you'd be captain someday. And, and so all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. This was 22 years after David was anointed by Samuel to be king in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13, 22 years later, it came to pass and David was made king over all Israel. And then Dr. Foster, David did something that most consider uh, to, be, to be the most important geographical move in the Bible. The most important geographical move in the Bible, if you read chapter 5, verse 6 and down, where you'll see where David moved the capital of Israel from Hebron to Zion. He moved the capital to Jerusalem. The most important geographical move in the Bible. The location of Jerusalem. Zion in the eyes of God is the center of the earth. The most important, the most beautifully situated piece of land on earth in God's eyes is Zion. I know you thought it was Raleigh, but it's not. It's Zion. And David moved the capital there. And after David moved the capital, if you read in chapter 8, you'll see Oh my, if you go to uh, chapter 6, chapter 5, chapter 5, excuse me, and verse 10, it says, And David went on and grew great, and the Lord of hosts was with him. Go to chapter 8, you'll see where not everybody was happy. The Philistines got mad um, uh, and, and wanted to fight him and wanted to stop him. Uh, but you know what? God delivered him and gave him victory over them. He destroyed them. You will see in chapter 8, you can read about David's military success. And after David had defeated all of his enemies, and David is sitting in a strong position, our text says, and David spake unto the Lord. Back to 2 Samuel chapter 22. The words of this song. He wrote the song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all of his enemies. He defeated the Philistines over and over and over, and he defeated Saul. So now David writes this psalm, which mirrors identically Psalms 18. If you read uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22, and you read Psalms 18, you'll think you're reading the same writings. 
And it, that's because chapter 22 is a psalm. It is Psalms 18. And, it, and David says here, the Lord is my rock. In Psalms 18, David begins with, I love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock. That is, he's my lofty tower. He's my, my refuge, my stability. He's my fortress. Look at what he says. He says, he's my deliverer. That is, he's my liberator, my God, my strength. In whom I will trust. Oh, let this word do something in your spirit. He even says, he's my buckler. He's my shield. And the horn of my salvation. He is my strong deliverer. And then he says, and he's my high tower. What is this? God knows how to put you in a spiritual place in life where you see things coming. Where life doesn't always catch you off God. See, sometimes in dealing with things, it's just being able to see what's coming. Praise the Lord. Sometimes we're surprised when death hit, or we're surprised when famine hits, or we're surprised when someone leaves us, or we're surprised. Some of us, everything in life catches us off God. But if you let the Lord, the God will make you foresight where you can see down the road and you can see what the devil is doing and you can say, now that I see, I know how to prepare. I know how to pray. I know how to allow the Lord to fortify me. See, some of us, the reason why life hurts so bad is that we try and deny what we see. And the Lord may show you that sometimes God will show you so-and-so is not going to make it. Or this is not going to work out. Or that, you, know, or you, shouldn't, you shouldn't marry this individual. And you know what? We want what we want so bad that we refuse to see. Now, you can't blame God for not showing you. You just refuse to see. For it to work, you got to see what he's showing you. Now, you got to see what he's showing you. What he show you. What do you mean? Sometimes God shows it to us and we close our eyes. Sometimes God shows us things and we close our eyes and we rebuke the devil, say, I won't receive it. There ain't no way I'm not going to receive it. And, and yet, and, and, and instead of saying, now, Lord, prepare me. Jesus went to Peter and said, Simon, Simon, Satan have sought and obtained permission to sift you like wheat. I, I can see Simon's face drop. But they, then the Lord says, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail you not. What did he tell Peter? He told his disciples, said, now tonight, all of you are going to leave me. Uh, he says, for it is written, uh, they will smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Peter said, Lord, doesn't make any difference. If all of them leave you, I'm not going anywhere. And Jesus looked at him and said, before the cock crow, you'll be the first. You will deny me three times. What he should have done when the Lord gave him, uh, what the Lord gave him, he should have went to praying right then. Sometime when the Lord show you some things, stop acting like you don't see it and, and begin to co co confess to him, no way this is going to happen. Yes way. So he's showing you this is what is on the horizon. That's a blessing. That's an advantage to be put on a tower so that you can see. Do you not know from a psychological perspective, one of the worst places for a human being, one of the worst states for a human being is, and I'm not a psychologist, I just play one on Sunday. One of the worst places for a human being is to be in a state of dismay. That's why we're told throughout the scripture, be not dismayed. Be not dismayed. What is dismay? Bewilderment. You don't know what to think. Saints try to commit suicide when they don't know what to think. Saints leave Jesus when they don't know what to think. Saints get bitter. Saints lose their way when they don't know what to think. Saints think the worst when they don't know what to think. So the Lord wants to keep you in a place where you know what to think. 
that you have some thoughts on the matter. Oh, let me let me speed up here. Uh, you all, you were with me. I must have messed up somewhere. This is good preaching, isn't it? Yes, sir. In this text, David says, I love the Lord. Praise the Lord. And in verse 18, we see some things about the Lord. As we move further in this chapter, we learn that the God of the Bible will give us power to defeat enemies but are stronger than we are. David says, he delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me for they were too strong for me. <laughs> I love it. Saints, there are things that are too strong for us. But just because it's too strong for you, nothing is too strong for God. No situation is too strong for the Lord. There's no load that you'll ever bear that the Lord won't help you bear. Praise the Lord. You ask God, Lord, I can't take this. The Lord says, I'll see you through. I'll bring you out. Hallelujah. David says, he delivered me from an enemy that was too strong for me. And look at this. He says, verse 19, and, and they prevented, that is, they confronted me in the day of my calamity. But the Lord was my stay. The God of the Bible, no matter what happens, will always be your stay. That is, he will always be your supply. Why is this so important? This is so important because the world is getting darker. 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 And you can't run out of strength. You can't, you can't, you can't walk around uh, saying, I'm getting weak and uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. No, 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 no. The Lord is our state. The Lord is our supply. I was talking to a Christian the other day who seemed like they were running out of gas. And they kept telling me, you know, you know, you know. And I said every time, no, I don't know. No, no, don't, don't, no, don't, don't assume I know. I don't know. What are you doing running out of gas? God is our supply. The Bible says our sufficiency is of God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. We still serve the God who is more than enough. Mm. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. He's my supply. He's my stay. And not only is he my supply, but I want to tell you something. He's our deliverer. David said in the 20th verse, uh, he brought me forth. Look at this. Also unto a large place. That is, he brought me out and put me in a spacious place. And notice to underscore God's delivering power. David says, he delivered me. Praise the Lord. He brought me forth unto a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Is that something right there? He delivered me because he delighted in me in me. Our God is a deliverer. Our God is a deliverer. Praise the Lord. Look at your neighbor and tell him he will deliver. He brought me forth also unto a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Now if you read, if you read and I, I want to read it to you, but you can read it on your own. If you read verse 21 and down, you see the role that holiness plays. You see the role that righteousness plays. He says here, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanliness of my hands hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. A little footnote here. One of the things that distinguished David was he was one of the few kings, uh, the same was true of Josiah, who never served anybody but God. 
Oh, he made some errors in his life. And by the way, at the time that he wrote this text, uh, the fall with Bathsheba was not covered in this particular writing. David says, I have, praise the Lord, kept the ways of the Lord and have not, look at this, and have not wickedly departed from my God for all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him and have kept myself from mine iniquity. Now, the reason this particular passage here is such a wet blanket is that the new emphasis in this day and time, Prophetess Calloway, in the church world is unconditional love. Unconditional grace, unconditional blessings, unconditional, which implies that to be blessed and kept of God, God doesn't require that the believer come out of anything. That God understands and that no matter how we live, we're going to get what we, what we want from the Lord anyway. David said, yes, he brought me out, but I lived before him. Yes, he gave me power over my enemies, but he, but, uh, but I did right. Some of us are waiting for the Lord to move in mighty ways and scheming. If you want something from God, how about presenting to God a holy life? How about calling on him? How about turning your plate down? Praise the Lord. You, you're in a hole and you need for God to move and yet you're not putting forth any effort to get closer to him. There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. Because let me tell you something. We serve a God who will deal with us the way we deal with him. Now where is that in the Bible? I'm glad you asked. In verse 26, with the merciful, thou shalt show thyself merciful. And with the upright uh, man, thou shalt show thyself upright. And with the pure, thou will show thyself pure. And with the forward, thou will show thyself. But look at this. But with the forward, thou will show thyself unsavory. That is, with the arrogant, with the haughty, God says, I'm going to bust them. But if you walk up right before me, see, we, God responds to us the way we respond to him. So if we drag our feet when it comes to him, well, he drags his feet when it comes to us. We want the Lord to move on our behalf uh, in a New York second, but we want to get, we want to move on God's behalf when we get around to it. Cain brought his to God in the process of time. Abel brought his to God off the top. Abel's were received, Cain was rejected. Oh, don't you, listen, don't, thank God we have the best praise team in the world, but don't need a praise team to give him praises. Thank God we've got a great church house band, but don't need a band to dance. Thank God, thank God we've got the Bible and we're teaching you the way. Don't ignore the word of God and still expect to get miracles and things from the Lord. Draw now closer. Oh, I must be preaching to some Presbyterians. Draw closer unto the Lord. If you draw closer unto God, God will draw closer unto you. Then I heard him say, in verse 29, For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. In this dark world, I'm glad that we have a light. America is the home of over 2,000 plus different religions. The other day, uh, presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke said that if churches don't accept same-sex marriage, he will, if, may, if he becomes president, will try to revoke their 501c3 status. We're in a day now where the world, I warned you, the world is now saying we don't want to coexist. I told you that. I told you they want to conquer us. But you didn't listen to me. Oh, say amen. I told you. I warned you. You told me I was crazy. Now, who, now who's crazy? Seemed like to me I was right. I warned you that the whole goal of that stuff was to dominate the believer. 
It was written years ago in their own manifesto. We want to dominate you. We want your sons to crave us. We want to take over. We will infiltrate your institutions of learning. We will infiltrate, infiltrate the, uh, the, the entertainment institution. We will in, infiltrate and we will condition the minds of people. Oh, it is happening on both sides. While Beta O'Rourke the other day was... Uh, at a CNN town hall pandering to some wicked, crazy LGBTQ people. It always takes a black man, I don't know why it's always us, to run and grab the mic and uh, put a wig on, calling himself a trans woman. No such thing. That was a man. A man, a man took over and he acted the pure fool. It was embarrassing. And then I was watching Fox News as they were uh, reporting on what the crazies were doing on CNN. And Fox News brought on an intelligent, clean-cut, oh, white guy to refute the crazy, out-of-control uh, LBGTQs on CNN. And then later on, Fox brought a clean-cut black guy to refute what was going on with the crazies on CNN. Mm -hmm. But in both, both uh, uh, of the men that Fox brought on, both men revealed that they too were married to men and that they too were a part of the community, but they're not crazy like the other people. Well, I want you to know that the clean-cut ones are the worst for they are false apostles. Good God Almighty, they are false apostles, false prophets. Praise the Lord, disguising themselves to be one thing when they're just as wicked as the other group. What am I trying to say? You can't make a God out of liberalism. And uh, you can't make a God out of conservatism. You can't make a God out of uh, any political party. You got to serve the God of the Bible because both of them will let you down. But I'm glad to know that I'm not confused because the Lord is my light. I didn't go back when I saw that clean cut, articulate black guy who had served in the armed forces, white teeth, clean cut, articulate, never split a verb, but, he, but married to a man, he's just as wicked and just as wrong as that man running around with a wig on, splitting every verb. What am I saying? Ain't nobody right but the God of the Bible. And you got to have the courage of your conviction to call a spade a spade, to say what need to be said when it need to be said. And there ain't no confusion when the Lord is your light. Ain't no confusion when the Lord is your lamp. Aren't you glad today that you know what is right and you know what is wrong? Yeah! Yeah! Somebody praise him if you're glad. Matter of fact, let's encourage each other today. Just shake two or three people's hands. Just tell them, I'm glad I'm not confused. I'm glad, I'm glad. Good God Almighty. I'm glad that I'm not confused. I'm glad that I am not confused about language. If the president get up and cuss, that don't confuse me. I'm not going to cuss because he cuss. I don't care who does what. I get my marching orders between Genesis and Revelation. God have not changed. He told us uh, to speak a blessing. The saints are called to a higher level of living. And I'm glad today that God is taking
taking us from being on the defensive. We're dodging bullets, ducking the devil's blows, stepping out of the devil's way. It's good to be able to defend. It's good to be able to duck when you need to, but it's better to be on the offensive. It's better to be the one carrying the battle. It's better to be the one leading the charge. Yeah! Yeah, Lord! I heard David say, oh, Lord, he said, by my God, have I run through a troop. The word troop there means barricade. When the enemy has put his barricades up with God's strength, with God on my side, he gave me the ability not to run from the devil, but to run at him, to run to the roar. Stop, stop being so afraid. Hallelujah. He's given us power to cast out devils. He's given us power to walk on serpents and scorpions. He's given us power. He's given us power. Power to live holy. Power to say to yonder's mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. Power. Yeah, 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 Lord. Somebody celebrate your power right now. Woo. Power, power, power. Oh, Lord. I need, I'm, about, I'm almost through. I need about 10 people to just jump and say, I'm advancing. I'm advancing. Because that's what the text is. It's advancing. It's moving forward. It's going in to the devil's territory. David said, I am now that y'all have made me king of Judah. David said, I'm going to move the headquarters from Hebron to Jerusalem. Hallelujah. You know what they said in Jerusalem? They said, no way. You're not strong enough. You're not man enough. They said, our lame, our blind are stronger than you are, David. You will never be able to capture Jerusalem. The Bible said, after they talked, all of that big talk, the Bible said, David captured Jerusalem and changed the name. Hallelujah. The next thing I know, it was called the city of David. Let me tell you something. When the devil tells you that you can't win, you ought to capture that territory and name it after yourself because you have more power than the devil has. You have more power than your enemy. And if the enemy is too strong, there is nothing, there is no one too strong for the Lord. Come on, praise him. Praise him for his power. Praise him for his healing. Praise him for his power. David said, you know what? You telling me I can't, I can't have Zion. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna take Zion and they're gonna name it the city of David. Come on, men. This is the kind of men that God is calling us to be. Daring men, 
fighting men, not men who are indecisive, not men who are constantly sitting around complaining, blaming every trouble on society. I can't do anything because the white man won't let me. I can't get ahead because the country is working against me. I can't be anything because won't nobody help me. Help yourself. Ask God to give you power. Ask God to give you the anointing. Call on him. Won't he make you strong? Call on him. Call him. Let me, let, let, let me kill this thing. See, everything's different. When I, mother, you know, when I was a young minister, you know what the older minister said when we got ready to launch and what we got ready to do? It ain't like it is now. You know what they told us? If the Lord sent you, the Lord will provide. You know, you, know, you know what was after that? To the loo. That's right. <sighs> and, they, and the test as to whether or not it was God was your survival. What is this now? All these weak guys need to be planted. You got to give them furniture, half your members, all the money. You got to make all this investment. I told you you ain't going to say amen. When, 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 when Ezra got ready to go down to Jerusalem, everything is in the Bible. The king said to Ezra, would you like for me to give you a military escort? Because there are marauders, there are enemies on the trip. Ezra said, no, because I have already said that my God, whom I serve, is able to deliver us. Oh my God. Somebody ought to preach to somebody and say, I've already said that my God, my God, whom I serve, he's able. He's able. He's able. David said he was feeling invincible. He said, my God, through my God, have I broke through barricades. See, because what he did, he took Zion. And then, see, when the Philistines came to get him, to fight, he just beat them back. David, see, under David's reign, uh, the, the Israel as a nation, under David's reign, had one of the largest expansions that it had. See, some of us, see, the, the new philosophy is to just, at best, maintain your ground. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Maintain your footing. Yes, sir. You won't pray because you showed up at church. Hallelujah. You ain't never brought anybody with you your whole saved life. You ain't never convinced one person. You really think that you're doing something just to show up. That's the new thinking. Jesus said, make disciples. That's right. That's right. That's right. Influence people. Lord, it just took all that I had to get to church today. That, that's good for some Sundays. But that ought not to be your mantra for 52 Sundays. You mean tell me, for all your years... All this time, that's the best you can come up with? Then you need to read about David. We need to read about these warriors, and you need to get offline, and you need to stop listening to these sissy preachers, these, these guys who are full of uh, estrogen. They need bras. They're full of estrogen, and they're, they're big-time they're big softies, 
and they're teaching you how to be soft. They're teaching you to be soft. So you can't, you can't fight. You need to study David. There are, more, there are more stories in the Bible about David than David and Bathsheba. And at least, and now one thing about him now, now one thing about him now, now if, you, now, now if you read his life, he loved women and had a whole lot of children. Praise the Lord. Uh, Praise the Lord. He was a, he was a man. Now, I'm not I'm not preaching I'm not preaching immorality. But what I'm trying to show you I'm trying I'm trying to show you a man the mindset. See the the new the new church. Oh, they're gonna bust me online for this. The new church. You are a whining church. You're saying whining music with a whining sermon. With a whining praise and worship. All you want to do is whine. All you want to talk about is what you're going through. And what somebody did to you. And what someone said about you. Bump that. Bump that. That's not God. That's not God. David said, by my God have I run through a barricade. Somebody shout, run through it. Run through it. Run through it. Everybody has barricades in front of them. Run through it. Ah! It's a mindset. It's a mindset. And he says, after I got through the barricade, he said, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm all in to the Philistines' territory. I'm all in to the enemy's territory. See, see I, uh, I'm taking back what the devil stole from. He can have it. I'm going in. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. A Roman general would never get a triumph, would never get a parade, unless he extended the Roman territory. He would not get a parade for maintaining his ground. He, would not, he, he might get killed for losing ground. But he only got a parade. King James called it a triumph when he extended the kingdom. Hence, now thanks be unto God who always causeth us to triumph. I was talking to a preacher. And I rebuked him. I, I rebuked him. He had visited a church. Big church. And uh, he was talking about that, talking about that church he visited. And because it was a different kind of church, he was concerned about the future of the church of God and Christ and our impact and all that kind of stuff. And I said, well, I said, well no, we were talking now. You, you're talking about an organization that's been around for over 100 years. So now, we, we worry about its future and its perpetuity. The church you're talking about been around for 10, 15 years. So let me tell you, just arrived. Uh, don't move me. You can't, uh, 100 years and counting, just got here. We'll see. But I said to him, I said, but what you're not paying attention to is the particular city that this church is in with all these members, is the most wicked city in the particular state that he's in. The sisters run the city. Crime is rampant in the city. Black on black crime, black on white crime, white on black crime, or oh, you name it, the city is the leading city where they're putting up uh, 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 little posters where men and women can use the same bathrooms and transit. I mean, the city is just wicked. So I said, what you should be paying attention to, well, I was just thinking, no, the problem is you're not thinking. What you should be paying attention to is how is it that this great picture of all these people that made you wonder about the Church of God in Christ and its longevity, how is it that that church has no influence in this wicked city? 
You can't get the pastor of that church to go to one abortion clinic. You can't get them to fight for any law, anything that come down the pike that is of any note. This huge church is noticeably absent. To get people to get saved, they got plants in the congregation that when the preacher make the altar call, the plants, the actors come up pretending to be getting saved, hoping to get others to get saved. And you're impressed by a church like that. No wonder it has no influence. It's not real. This is not advancing the kingdom. That may be padding your pockets, but it's not advancing the kingdom. That's not influence. David said, I'm going to advance this thing. Not only did I get through the troop, I'm done. Check this out, Wilson. Guess what he got to? The last line. What was the last thing? What was the last thing? The wall. See, the barricades were designed to keep him from getting to the wall. Because see, once you get over the wall, the fortress is done. Show's over. David said, I got to the wall. I broke through the barricades, but then I got to the wall. And the wall was high. But the same God who gave me strength to break through the barricade gave me leaping ability. And he said, by my God, have I leaped over the wall. And once he got over the wall, the rest of it was cake. Just, just the same thing happened in Jericho. It wasn't the town. The issue was the wall. If you could just get the wall down or scale the wall or whatever, if you could penetrate the wall, you'll win. And God told uh, Gideon, so just walk around the wall. And when I tell you to shout, tell them to shout the, 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 uh, the sword of the Lord and Gideon, and they shouted, and the walls fell flat. See, God will either knock the walls down or give you the ability to leap over them. What is the, I'm done. What is the point of this sermon? It is the will of the God of the Bible that saints remain aggressive-minded. That saints not, uh, Brother Listen B, that we not adopt this victim mentality that the world is trying to sell us. Oh, you, you can see, y'all, I'm, I'm sure you can see it on the commercials. Do you see how the average black man is portrayed in the commercial? Uh, will, will, will somebody give me this phone? Can I have this phone right now? Boy, I look at that commercial. Every time I see it, I just want to just grab the TV. But the television costs too much. I want to just grab the TV and just throw it up against the wall. The way they portray us. And we are so, we are all too happy. The, the word is that we show us a camera, we'll act a fool. We'll sell out for fame. You're not going to think that way. We are winners. We are warriors. We are on the offense. All this stuff, all these sermons about all these hurting people. I went looking for all these hurting people. I couldn't find them. Everybody I ran to was mad, upset, tried to hurt me. The world is just full of hurting people. Look, so many people are not hurting. They're wicked. Yes. See, we need to use the right language. Yes, right. Yes, right. So selling drugs to your own people. Well, and we're talking about, look at him, he's hurting. No, I'll tell you who he's hurting. He's hurting his neighborhood. He's hurting sons and daughters. That's who's hurting. Who wants to be strong? Who wants God to give you power to keep running and leaping if I'm talking to you? I didn't say power to stop. Because this sermon today is for the warriors, for the fighters, because sometimes those of us who look at the saints, they, they're coming. I can't, I, I hadn't even said come yet. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes when you're a saint, oh, this thing gets heavy. It, it gets heavy because he threw the manifold. Yes, what do you do when the devil just coming after you? The NFL teaches you 
How do you beat a team with a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes? How do you beat a team with a fantastic offense? Here's how. Here's how. Where's Coach Mebbin? Is he here today? Coach, tell me if I'm right. I know you're, you're, you're a basketball coach, but you know sports. You keep their offense off the field. You come up with an offensive strategy of your own where you get a good running game. Slow the pace of the game down. Take all three downs to get a first down. Don't want to score too fast. Right. And you just methodically yes. keep that bad quarterback standing on the side. Because yes, if he can't get on the field, he can't throw the ball. Throw the ball. If he's standing there long enough, he's going to get stiff. Right. Nobody gets involved in the game uh, like those who are involved in the game. So if he, if he spectates too long, a mental shift takes place right. and he becomes a spectator. And there you go, slowly and methodically, playing your game. God have given every one of you, God have given every one of us, a offensive game. For too long, we've been defensive players, defensive soldiers. God told me to tell you, take that heel. The Lord told me to tell you that you're not a victim. The Lord told me to tell you, you can handle it. Keisha, you have built for it. The Lord said, you can handle it. Amen. The Lord said, tell him, tell him. Tell him I'll give him power to keep running. Tell him I'll give him power. Give me the oil. Tell him I'll give him power. Father, in Jesus' name. We pray for power. We pray for power today to keep running and to keep jumping. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The Lord just touch you right now, sir. Lord touch you. And Lord heal your body. God touch and heal you again. God restore him, Lord. Give him his strength in the name of Jesus. Touch his wife. Cause your face to shine on him in the name of Jesus. Oh, God. And around this altar, touch the warriors. Touch the fighters. Touch the saints. Touch every man, woman, boy, and girl. And give them this mentality. The mentality to take life by the horns. The mentality, hallelujah, to advance the kingdom of God. The, the mentality of an offensive Christian. Lord, we've been on the defense for so long that we don't hardly know how to go on the offense. But God give everybody, give the saints the ability to put one foot in front of the other to put one foot in front of the other, to begin to attack those challenges, again to address those shortcomings in the name of Jesus, and to know that you are with them. God told me to tell you that he's with every one of you. He said, preach this to the church today. Tell them I've given them power to keep on running, to keep on leaping. All they got to do is just grab hold to it in the name of Jesus and make a vow before the Lord. Tell the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to run on all the way. God, give me strength to run on in the name of Jesus to keep on preaching, to keep on living right, to keep on raising the family, to keep going through, to be a witness on the job, in school and in college and in the community, to be a different kind of person, a different kind of man, a different kind of white man, a different kind of black man, a different kind of white woman, a different kind of black woman, a different kind of person, a saint who has the joy of the Lord, the saint who says I love the Lord because he heard my cry, a saint who knows who 
Jehovah is a saint who knows the power that's in the name of Jesus. We will not give in. We will not wear out. We will not commit suicide. We will not go astray. We will not be weak. But we have victory. For the Lord have given us the shield of victory. We have. We can fight because the Lord have broadened our space. We have a rock. We have a high tower. We have stability. We have these things. You who are streaming, I'm praying for you as well. We have these things. Now give God praise. Give God glory. Give him, give it to him, give it to him, give it to him. Come on, around the altar, around the altar. Give him your best praise. Give him your best worship. Give it to him. You don't need my hand. You don't need my hand. You have the Lord with you. You don't need anybody. You have the Lord with you. Jesus is where you are. Get your breakthrough. Get your breakthrough. Get your breakthrough. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Get your breakthrough. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Let him change your mind. Let him change your mind. Hallelujah. Let him give you a warrior's mentality. I'm moving forward. I can handle this. I, I can do it mentality. I, I can handle this mentality. The Lord is with me. 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 The Lord, 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 the Lord. That's right, draw closer to him. Draw closer to him. Draw closer to him. Get it on your own. Get it on your own. When you get it on your own, you know you got it. It's been preached to you. Now get it on your own. Yeah! Yeah, Lord! Ah, Jesus! Ah, Jesus! We praise you right now. Get ready to go by asking for power to keep on. Lord, let me keep on. Lord, let me keep on. Lord, let me keep on. Let me keep on running. Let me keep on leaping. Don't let me run out of gas. God, keep my soul on fire. In the name of Jesus, Lord, help me, help me. I'm reviving you right now. I'm reviving you right now. Glory to your name, Lord. Somebody's getting revived. Oh, glory to God. As I was working out this sermon uh, of Thursday, when was it was Friday, whatever day it was, the Lord, the Friday, the Lord was reviving me as I worked it out. As I worked it out. As I worked it out. Burdens. Burdens. Challenges, this and that, and that and this.
God says, I got a word for you. I'll give you power. I'll give you power to keep running and to keep leaping. Right when the devil thinks that he's uh, uh, dampened you a little bit. Amen. Amen. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Next week, some people are going to leap over some walls. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no.